Olá a todas e todos que nos assistem. Meu nome é Marcos Carvalho, sou graduado em Ciências Sociais, mestre em Saúde Coletiva, doutor em Antropologia e atualmente pós-doutorando pelo Programa de Pós-Graduação em Antropologia da URGS. Comigo nesse debate também está Marina Nutti, graduada em Ciências Sociais, mestre e doutora em Saúde Coletiva e atualmente pós-doutoranda pelo Instituto de Medicina Social da UERJ. Hoje nós teremos a imensa alegria de receber Debolina Roy, professora de Neurociência e Biologia Comportamental e Estudos de Mulher, Gênero e Sexualidade da Universidade de Emory, nos Estados Unidos, e discutir seu livro Feminismos Moleculares, Biologia, de Vires e a Vida no Laboratório, publicado em 2018. Well, thank you all for the invitation. Um, you know, I'm really honored to be joining this group and to be able to share uh, some of my work, but also to engage in these kind of cross communications and cross dialogues. Um, it's so exciting. And I was, uh, you know, thinking that uh, with all the other horrible, uh, you know, um, impacts of the pandemic, this has been actually kind of a gift to be able to uh, connect with people around the world um, and to kind of keep building um, this work and these projects. Uh, so I'm very excited to be joining this conversation. So I'm going to, um, you know, uh, talk a little bit today about um, uh, science, feminism and becoming. Um, but before I begin, I'd like to give, you know, some working definitions and share some definitions um, that will help maybe in some of the questions that um, we'll be uh, discussing together and the questions that will come up. There are three kind of main themes, I think, that run through my work uh, that I want to share with you. And the first is, of course, feminism, uh, which most of you will be familiar with this uh, term and this word. But I think that for no matter where you are, um, what this word or the idea means is it can differ. And, you know, uh, here being in the U.S., uh, I myself am from Canada, but, you know, even coming to the U.S., I saw that there was a change and a shift in how most people think about feminism. And they think about it, uh, you know, in many instances as this kind of liberal, humanist, kind of equal rights feminism, uh, that women and men should be equal, which is, you know, absolutely the case. They should be treated equally. They should be paid equally for equal work. Uh, but that kind of equality feminism is one type of feminism. And I think my own entry into feminism um, when I entered into it was more to think about it as kind of a, a toolkit, a toolkit that has been informed by politics, that has been informed by social justice work, by um, activists and advocates to think about questions of norms and to also help us think about questions of marginalization. So whenever you do establish some kind of uh, norm, what ends up happening is that those who do not conform to that end up on the outskirts or on the margins. And this is true in the case of, you know, what kind of sex uh, or gender categories are seen as norms. But for myself, as you know, a woman of color growing up in uh, Toronto, I think I used feminism to, as a toolkit to think about questions of race, questions of sexuality, questions of ability, um, and, and more, and questions of class as well. So I see feminism really as this kind of overarching toolkit that one can apply to a multitude of, of issues and questions. The second uh, theme that I talk a, a fair bit about in my work is the idea of the molecular. And I am a molecular biologist by training. So I'm obviously playing with the term molecular here, but it is really kind of uh, kind of uh, in contrast to what might be thought of as the molar. And in this case, um, the molecular, it not only relates to molecules, but it's I'm borrowing here from uh, some terminology that has been used by philosophers and the French philosophers in particular, Deleuze and Guattari, and several feminist philosophers who have taken this work to describe those kind of minoritarian projects and politics. And by minoritarian, I do not simply mean like a kind of a, a group of people who are in the minority, but rather those ideas 
that are, are, are often not heard. Those ideas that kind of get lost, those ideas that um, don't make it to the surface or become popularized. I'm more thinking about the types of questions we can ask and the types of modes of politics we might follow that aren't the usual way. So in terms of feminism, a molecular approach to that would be instead of equal rights feminism, to think about difference feminisms um, here in the US particularly, and to amplify the idea of differences. The last concept that I talk about is becoming. And this also I am borrowing. Uh, it's a philosophical concept that emphasizes the capacities of flux and change, where the properties and components of nature are understood in terms of processes and events. And this is an important theme for me because, you know, even training as a scientist, um, you know, we are often thought you, uh, you know, are in um, engaging or observing a certain object of study as if that object itself is going to be fixed as soon as you have, as a scientist, placed your eyes on it or tried to define it. But molecular biology taught me that actually, you know, things are not fixed. Um, objects, our so-called objects of study, actually change. And what we're maybe getting a glimpse of is a process rather than um, a being. So those are some uh, important kind of ideas that I want to begin with. And, uh, and I'll go into some more kind of introductions of myself and my background. Um, as a feminist neuroscientist and as a joint faculty member in the Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies uh, and Neuroscience and Behavioral Biology here at Emory University, interdisciplinary work has in fact been my bread and butter. After years of conducting research and teaching courses across the natural sciences and the humanities, I know that interdisciplinarity can be thought of in multiple ways. So the primary focus of my interdisciplinary work has been motivated by a commitment to understanding and learning to appreciate the intricate practices of disparate disciplines. This may be due to the fact that I began, began my own training as a scientist and began training to become a feminist scientist during a time that is now referred to as the science wars. So for those of you who might be familiar or unfamiliar, sorry, with the science wars, this was a period of heated debate and somewhat hostile exchanges between scientific realists and post-structuralists that took place in the mid to late 90s. And these debates involved discussions around scientific objectivity and the possibilities of societal influences on scientific inquiry, what we might refer to today, for example, as unconscious bias. So the publication of several books and journal articles during this period led to a series of high profile debates and disputes. And in some cases, a deep mistrust um, began to grow between academics in the sciences and the humanities, if that mistrust was not already there. So as a graduate student in the neurosciences in Canada, I started my PhD in molecular biology and reproductive neuroendocrinology, just as the science wars were in full swing. I was actually blissfully unaware of one of the most scandalous scholarly disputes that transpired during the uh, science wars. It was referred to as the so-called affair. And we can talk about that more in the, the discussion after. But somehow I had already come to the understanding that science and society were co-constituted. I already knew that I wanted to become a feminist scientist who could bring reproductive justice work into conversation with reproductive biology research. I also knew that this would entail learning the intricate practices of disparate disciplines and developing an appreciation for different ways of encountering the world. So looking at this image now, you know, it's hard for us to believe that so many people would have been to come together in a march, uh, let alone, you know, a march for science. But this was just a picture from the March for Science two years ago that was held here in Atlanta. And, um, you know, I find that this has become a very interesting kind of moment to think about. Uh, you know, for nearly two decades after the science wars, wars I think we've have fi we find ourselves in a new era we find ourselves in a political time and a place where all forms of academic research, whether in the physical and natural sciences, the social sciences or the humanities, 
all are uh, potentially under some kind of threat. And who would have thought back in the 90s when the science wars were raging that scientists would have to stand up for science itself? Who would have imagined that scientists would be marching for science? And it turns out that the skills that humanity scholars and social justice advocates have had to hone over the last two decades, including interdisciplinary institution building, community organization and outreach, and finding creative ways for obtaining funding support, these are now skills that are required by everyone in academia, scientists included. And in a curious way, I do see this strange moment as also providing us with opportunities for forming new interdisciplinary alliances. So my book, Molecular Feminisms, Biology Becomings and Life in the Lab, is really a project about learning how to make interdisciplinary connections. It is not written so much as a treatise following the science wars, but rather as a guide for building coalitions and for creating what I like to refer to, and I borrow this idea um, of a horizontal social movement from within the sciences and the humanities. The book aims to provide a reflective space for both feminist scientists in the natural sciences who participate in bench research, as well as feminists in the humanities and social sciences who are eager to use scientific research and data to inform their feminist analyses. It also invites scholars of feminist theory, post-colonial studies, philosophy of science, animal studies, post-humanist ethics, and the biological sciences to participate in joint conversations and create shared vocabularies for interdisciplinary work. And this project really began with the scientific research I conducted on the molecular effects and signal transduction mechanisms of melatonin, estrogen, and androgen receptors in an in vitro model of hypothalamic gonadotropin releasing hormone neurons or GnRH neurons. So I wanna talk a little bit about that project. So my work in reproductive uh, neuroendocrinology and molecular biology revealed the presence and mechanisms of feedback regulation by pineal and gonadal hormones at the level of the brain and particularly at the level of the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis or the hypothalamus in the brain. This axis or the HPG axis um, has been thought of in terms of this kind of hierarchy that the brain is the control center and it sends out signals to uh, the pituitary to release luteinizing hormone and follicle stim stimulating hormone, which in uh, turn are to turn on the ovaries and testes to secrete estrogen and testosterone. The idea that actually estrogen and testosterone may be feeding back at the level of the brain and particularly at the level of these generation neurons had not been explored uh, at the time that I was doing my research. So this research where I did find these uh, receptors, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail, um, at it, these GnRH neurons that they were found here, it actually was significant for two reasons. The first being that um, this work provided evidence against a top-down or hierarchical paradigm that was commonly being used to study this uh, axis in mammals. And the second point is that these findings showed that hormone-based contraceptives and hormone replacement therapies or any hormone mediated medical intervention may not only act at the level of the ovaries and the testes or the uterus and the breast tissue, but may also have broader systemic effects, including neuroendocrine regulation of things such as circadian rhythmicity and other reproductive functions. So I was really brought to this work though, to ask these questions in the lab because of my exposure um, to feminist uh, organizing and reproductive health advocates and activists uh, where I was uh, growing up in Toronto. So this uh, decision to pursue the scientific research was driven by this involvement with reproductive justice movements that were both at the local and the national level in Canada. And the challenge that I faced, however, when I did enter into the sciences and what I think was a motivating factor behind you know, trying to call myself a feminist scientist 
was that in order to get to the important findings that I know my, that reproductive justice advocates wanted to get more information, my research in the lab actually required using molecular biology techniques and practices that many feminists themselves were also very critical of and they harshly critiqued. And these practices in turn included the use of bacteria, transgenic animals, the in vitro cell line that I was using and recombinant DNA technologies. And so as a feminist scientist, you know, it became clear to me that for those of us who were out there who wanted to thought of themselves as feminists, but also wanted to participate in the creation of scientific knowledge on the body at the molecular and genetic levels, uh, and we wanted to work with the matter of biology, uh, facing such dilemmas was going to be an important part of our project. It was an important project, not just a feminist project, but of diversifying science. You know, we also often think of diversity in science and here in the States, particularly people are talking about diversity in STEM fields all the time. And they're talking about making sure that you have underrepresented minority groups, you know, um, coming into the sciences and staying. But for me, the question of diversifying science has always been more than just about who, which bodies and what color of skin are the scientists. It's also about what are the questions that we're asking within that lab. And feminism provided me with that toolkit to think about how I was gonna try to diversify science. So since then, the dilemmas that I've encountered in trying to practice science as a feminist and as a feminist of color have been challenging, but they have been very productive also. They've provided me with a skill set that has been born out of trying been born out of trying to create these kind of interdisciplinary research and collaborative methods. And as a result, my efforts and contributions have been focused on creating more sustained dialogues, as I say, on questions that surround uh, you know, ethics of science, the question of difference of science, and the question of um, materiality and materialisms at the intersections of molecular biology research, neuroscience research, and reproductive work. I also wanna pause here for a moment and just talk a little bit about kind of uh, the motivating factors. And this is where I think, you know, um, that diversity of, of science is important and where your uh, questions come from. You know, we talk about epistemology, which is the theory of knowledge of how do we know what we know? Well, I think we know what we know by the questions that we ask. And the questions that we ask are often informed from the places that we um, come from and that the you know, people that we surround ourselves and the non-humans that we surround ourselves with as well. And so my parents actually, they um, are from India and they migrated to Canada in the late 60s. And I think um, the part of India that they were from was uh, Bengal. So they're both Bengali. And I think it was both you know, important for both of them to instill in their children kind of this um, uh, knowledge and some pride of the heritage. And so, you know, when I was young and uh, it was becoming clear that I was very interested in the sciences and I wanted to become a scientist, my parents uh, introduced me to the work of Jagadish Chandra Bose. And, um, uh, you know, I found his work and the stories that I was told very interesting. But it was when I came across actually the soundtrack by Stevie Wonder, uh, The Secret Life of Plants, which was then made into a movie that featured J.C. Bose's work that um, I found that this was the type of science that I wanted to conduct. Uh, this, is, this is the type of experimentation that I could uh, see myself doing. So J.C. Bose, he actually, uh, this is a picture of him from um, 1926 when he was pre presenting uh, at the Sorbonne, but his, his work was on the nervous system of plants. And he was trying to figure, he was trying to show that it's not just humans that have this ability to respond. Um, he created this rich apparatus, uh, all kinds of apparatus to study, but this one particular to study the response in the living and the non-living, he was able to show that plants can respond to harm done to other plants. So if you inflict pain to another being, that being, uh, 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 you know, someone around it can sense that. And it's not just the case for humans. And this was demonstrated through J.C. Bose's work. I think this connection to the, to the non-human, to plants, 
um, was something that was embedded very uh, early in my time as I was growing up as a scientist. So some of the questions that I think it's, you know, as a feminist scientist, when you do enter into that lab and you bring that context with you, in my case, it was that context of thinking of what question can I ask that's different, motivated by someone like JC Bose's work. So when you do get back into that lab, what happens? Um, you know, in the book, I try to address some questions that both feminist scientists and scientist feminists may have in common. And these include, for example, how do we continue with science after the critique of science? How do we work toward a biology that we desire? And how are we to encounter the matter that is at hand? How can we bring questions of context with us when we do encounter these matters? And how can we reconfigure the relationship between the scientific knower and what is to become the known? So one of the kind of uh, approaches that I've used and part of the challenge of developing an interdisciplinary um, dialogue and an interdisciplinary experiment involves starting with, um, you know, these kind of distinct disciplinary vocabularies um, and trying to build a common vocabulary or a shared kind of sense of, of language between these two different knowledge systems. And building these shared vocabularies actually takes a great deal of time. So in the book, in Molecular Feminism, this is an example of one of those shared vocabularies that I'm trying to develop. And I use this phrase, the bio philosophies of becoming to um, kind of build a framework for this vocabulary. What I explore through biophilosophies of becoming is um, once, as I explained this ins idea of becoming instead of being, for the scientists to be able to appreciate that. This is a philosophical term um, used by, you know, as I said, uh, philosophers and French philo philosophers and feminist philosophers. But the scientist has to be able to connect to that. And so the book really does bring um, kind of the lab life into, um, conversation and try to make that bridge through three main categories. Um, and that is number one, changefulness and non-human becomings. Uh, and I illustrate that through the lives of in vitro cells, for example, kinship and hylozoism. And I try to make those connect connections as to have the scientists think of uh, themselves as a partner with what they are trying to study. And this idea of univocity and imminence that you know, um, there isn't this drive, we do not need to have this drive to constantly place things in a hierarchical way, uh, or also ask the scientists to reframe themselves um, as the kind of expert uh, who's gonna withdraw knowledge from their object. Rather, they become a partner in knowledge making with that, with that so-called object. And a lot of these lessons also, I, I learn and I talk about grass, you know, this is that affinity for plants that I mentioned before, that, you know, plants have a life, they are, you know, I mean, we have different categories for what counts as life. And some of them say, well, organic, if there's a carbon molecule in there, then there's some kind of organic life also possible. But uh, I think that um, the sentience that comes with um, the knowledge that plants can respond to other plants. I actually, uh, you know, found this also in uh, watching grass. And in the book, I talk about uh, a, an event that, you know, a tree came down in my forest, in my backyard, and it um, uh, killed the grass that was growing there. And for years, it took years for the grass to grow back. But what I realized is that in a way, just as feminism is a type of toolkit that we use, grass has a strategy. Grass has a strategy for connecting, for making connections, for actually demonstrating what a horizontal social movement can look like. And so I draw a lot from the expertise of grass and what we have come to know about grass um, by observing it uh, and thinking with it uh, in the book as well. So um, I asked this question, you know, what can grass do? And biophilosophies of becoming pro provide those tools for thinking about that broader conversation at the intersection 
of philosophy and science. And this bio, bio philosophy aims to think about and try to address the difficulty that arises when we examine more closely the relationship between a scientist and their so-called object of study. So perhaps it is due to my entry into the sciences by way of the reproductive justice frameworks, um, interrogating that relationship between the knower and the known has really been at the forefront of my research. By turning to key questions of ontology, epistemology, and ethics, I connect the feminist scientist's dilemmas in encountering what is that, uh, what is that to become the known in the lab to feminist post-colonial and decolonial STS interrogations of scientific knowledge production. And I do this by thinking with bacteria and whether and how they write by thinking with the everyday lab techniques involved in molecular biology research, such as cloning and subcloning, by thinking with in vitro cell lines, such as the hypothalamic neurons that I work with, and also, as I said here, by thinking with grass. So what I've come to really appreciate is that, you know, truly interdisciplinary work takes uh, a lot of time. It's full of failures, and it can often leave everyone concerned quite unsatisfied. And as, as exciting as, I, as I, it is for me to bring this interdisciplinary conversation forward, I am fully aware that in my attempt to write a book about, you know, a book about molecular feminisms uh, and a book for multiple audiences, I may have in fact written a book that is legible to no one except perhaps myself. And even that is not guaranteed. And so to that I say though, what can I say? It is an experiment. The book is an experiment. And uh, you know, I do talk about the life of an experiment. Uh, my, my scholarly inquiries have actually produced quite a rich life for me. Um, and for that, I'm thankful. And I'm now looking forward to an open discussion with um, my interlocutors. Bom, Debolina. É, para começar a nossa conversa, a gente gostaria de que você comentasse um pouco mais a respeito de um ponto muito importante na sua trajetória, que é a interdisciplinaridade. Nos seus textos, você evidencia uma dupla posição de feminista e cientista, ou cientista e feminista, né? E como esses papéis muitas vezes são vistos como contraditórios e inconciliáveis por colegas de diferentes áreas. Em especial, você discute seu posicionamento enquanto uma insider-outsider, né? Que não pertenceria completamente nem a um campo, nem a outro, ou melhor, que talvez ocupe justamente os espaços do meio. Em alguns momentos do seu trabalho, você também menciona a necessidade de modular a sua linguagem de acordo com o público com quem, com quem você está debatendo. Né? Você dá aula de gênero para neurocientistas e aula de neurociências para feministas e estudiosas de gênero. E nesse processo é muito interessante como você observa que acaba contrariando as expectativas que cada uma dessas audiências teria a respeito de você e do seu trabalho. Ou seja, enquanto o público das neurociências espera que você vá falar sobre aspectos relacionados ao cérebro feminino, né? o público dos estudos de gênero espera que você vá como uma informante privilegiada denunciar vieses e estereótipos das neurociências. Mas como uma insider outsider, você não faz nenhuma coisa nem outra, o que torna o seu trabalho ainda mais potente. Essa sua capacidade de dialogar com diferentes públicos também fica bastante evidente no seu livro. Né? O glossário do livro é um maravilhoso exemplo desses diferentes encontros que você traça. No glossário, por exemplo, tem tanto definições de técnicas utilizadas na ciência de bancada, definições de conceitos filosóficos e também de estratégias políticas, o que acaba por produzir um vocabulário próprio e compartilhado a partir desses diálogos. Você poderia comentar, então, um pouco mais a respeito da importância da formação interdisciplinar na sua trajetória? Como seus colegas de laboratório ou de universidade veem isso? E como professora, você tem visto essa interdisciplinaridade sendo incentivada também entre estudantes? Well, first of all, Marina, I want to thank you for such a rich question. Um, there's so much that I want to talk about here. I'm going to try to be concise. Um, So I'm going to kind of start backwards in, uh, in the uh, order of your question. So, you know, in asking me to comment about the importance of interdisciplinary training, that's the thing. You know, I, I, um, I trained as a scientist and I wanted, I see myself as a scientist, but I think from the very get go, it was very hard for me to draw borders 
of what counts as a proper scientist or scientific language or scientific inquiry. And so for me, you know, also seeing myself as a feminist, it was really, I, I do use those two words, you know, kind of beside each other, but the borders for me were never clear. Um, and this, you know, I think it resonates with the part that I was speaking about, Jagadish Chandra Bose, right? So Bose, he made all these um, instruments, apparatus for measuring. And, um, you know, and he also used, you know, electromagnetic waves. And, but when he was asked, why don't you patent these things? So then you can make some money and you can be the owner. He never wanted to patent anything because he thought that he his relationship to the plants, to the apparatus was one of along these kind of lines as a horizontal kind of, uh, you know, um, partner in this. So he did not have ownership over the knowledge of the plant or the technology of the apparatus. He didn't have this, what we call today, intellectual property, right? He didn't own that. So this kind of, this um, framework to thinking about science is a different type of, uh, you know, ontological framework to, to your understanding of who you are and what is around you. And so I think in that interdisciplinary training that I did, it was basically me constantly trying to bring in questions that I thought belonged or doing things in a way that, you know, my supervisors might have thought, no, this is not how you're going to train. In fact, you know, my, my dear PI, my supervisor for my PhD, I, she was very patient, but at some point she gave me this book, I remember, and it's the title of the book was How to Write Like a Scientist. Because whenever I was writing papers for the site, I would always bring in the my voice. I would bring in, and I wanted to talk about the methods section and talk about the cells that had been sacrificed and animals that had been killed. And those are not the things that belong in a scientific paper. It's supposed to be just, you know, like line by line, cut and paste from something. And for me, it was very hard to keep those boundaries. And so that, I guess, allowing yourself that discomfort of blurred boundaries is part of the interdisciplinary training. So I never trained as a, you know, a women's studies student. I just knew that I had um, the science I wanted to do, had to speak to the people that this, these, um, you know, technologies or medical interventions were, were one day going to be applied. It had to be something they wanted and they knew about and, you know, for them. And so I think um, that has been my training, you know, keeping these worlds alive. I will say, though, that since I became a faculty member, a professor of women's studies, um, and as a scientist, it has now prepared me for this uh, new role that I'm in. And I'm not sure if you... Um, said it in your introduction, but I'm now Dean of Faculty at Emory College of Arts and Science. And they want someone with my interdisciplinary expertise to be able to represent the faculty and to, you know, build more interdisciplinary research. And this is, I think, exactly, you know, a lot of universities use this term interdisciplinarity very often, but it is it is more rare to actually have someone who sits in, for example, in my case, the humanities and the sciences this way. But I think if you're a feminist and you're training in any field, you sit in these kind of in-between spaces, the, as you mentioned, you know, the space in the middle. So this space in the middle has given me some other kind of, I didn't plan on becoming a dean, but it has definitely given, you know, some kind of expertise at this point. The one thing also I found very interesting about, uh, you know, your question is, uh, it's true. My neuroscience colleagues expect me to present about the female brain and the gender studies colleagues expect me to kind of um, side with them in the critique of science and that, you know, science is not going to get us where we need to go. And I don't inhabit either of those places. And I think it really is because of my interest in those molecular questions 
in those stories that are less kind of the usual way to think about things, right? So for my neuroscience colleagues, the usual way to think about it is, well, if you're, you know, I, there's a male brain and a female brain. If you're going to talk about, you know, feminism, that's what you must be interested in. So they get surprised when I tell them, no, I'm actually interested in multiplying differences in the brain. And how do we think about that? And then with my gender studies colleagues, it's the same thing, you know? So, um, yeah, I really appreciate the question, Marina. I hope I was able to address a little bit of it. Obrigada. Continuando, é, o seu trabalho faz parte de um importante campo de estudos sobre gênero, feminismos e ciência, que é uma corrente que é bastante presente na antropologia da ciência no Brasil e aqui na REACT também, né? Um ponto que nos chama atenção na leitura do livro é a oscilação entre diferentes termos como feminista cientista e cientista feminista. Ora feminista vem na frente, ora cientista. Você poderia comentar essa diferença? Além disso, o seu trabalho com hormônios mostra na prática a capacidade de uma ciência feminista aplicada olhar a partir de novas perspectivas e desafiar o conhecimento científico hegemônico e fazer novas perguntas, né? fazer perguntas diferentes das que habitualmente são feitas no laboratório. É, um questionamento importante que você faz no começo do seu livro, aí eu vou citar um trecho, é sobre acerca dos conhecimentos que nós, como feministas, poderíamos ter criado até agora se não tivéssemos que gastar nosso tempo e energia produzindo contra-argumentos para a linguagem e paradigmas essencialistas ou deterministas nas ciências biológicas. É, você poderia comentar mais a respeito desse grande desafio de uma ciência feminista em combater reducionismos biológicos sem, contudo, deixar de lado a biologia? Um, Marina, thank you again for this question. Um, you know, I'm gonna, I think, go to the second part. Uh, you were quoting from, from my book, I wrote that line of often, uh, I often wonder what knowledges we as feminists might have created by now if we weren't constantly having to spend our time and energy producing uh, counterclaims, right? Uh, to essentializing a deterministic language. This is really coming from, I think, um, the uh, influence and the impact that reading a lot of black feminist theory um, in my early training as a women's studies scholar, um, it, it left a real impact with me. Because I think often in a lot of um, women's studies, as it's at least grown in the US, right, the field of women's studies um, does have a very kind of Eurocentric and uh, white feminist kind of lens. And so for me, uh, when I was learning this work uh, of women's studies, it was right around like uh, 2002, 2003, when a lot of the new materialist scholarship was coming forward. And one of the main kind of um, points that I, as I understood it, you know, in the critique of, for example, of Butler's work, is that feminists, because of second wave feminism, had somehow, there was the flight from nature, right? That there was this kind of, uh, that was the critique, that so many feminists had actually left the biology behind. And to me, when I was reading like black feminist literature or women of color um, theory and literature and black feminist thought and theory, that was never the case. They never had the, um, what to say, like the uh, privilege of being able to leave their bodies behind, right? Or biology behind. And that knowledge was being produced by these groups, whether it was in uh, university or outside and whether it was through activist work, nobody left biology behind. So this is why Audre Lorde's work actually did resonate a great deal with me. But she did pose the question, like what if our energy, you know, she, and this is not in the context of biology necessarily, but she has this line where, you know, it's exhausting to constantly be informing or, uh, you know, educating the oppressor of why they are oppressing the oppressed, right? It takes all of our energy and our creative energies are, there's nothing left behind when we're constantly doing that. So what if we could use some of our creative energies to, to build the world we desire? So I'm drawing from Audre Lorde directly there. I say, what if as feminists, we could actually build that biology that we desire. And of course it's in, you know, um, direct kind of um, 
conversation with, you know, a lot of that second wave feminism that was critiquing Freud, who had said anatomy is destiny. Well, if anatomy, and then, you know, they canceled, well, anatomy can't be destiny, therefore biology has nothing to do with, you know, where we're going to go. But I want to say that no, biology has something to do with something. But let's build a biology that takes us to that destiny where we want to go. And so that that's behind that. Um, quote for sure. Now the uh, first part of your question is about the use of the terms feminist scientist and scientist feminist. And for me, this was also one of the other sides of new materialism, which I actually really do appreciate. And that is that a lot of feminists have turned to scientific data to be able to um, go forward and, and, and expand projects. And I'm, I'm referring here particularly to Elizabeth Wilson's work, who's a dear colleague of mine, but also to a lot of, um, for example, the reproductive justice organizations that I work with. So right here in Atlanta, um, I had a chance to partner with Sister Song and Spark. And Sister Song is the oldest reproductive justice organization in the United States. Um, where, you know, people who, feminists and, uh, you know, activists and advocates want to use scientific data in order to, you know, move something forward. So in reproductive justice movements here in the States, it's more than just about, you know, the right to abortion or not. Often, you know, you think about reproduction, it becomes a reproductive rights issue. And that's where kind of equality feminisms also falls, right? where it's, you know, you're pro-choice or you're pro-life, but reproductive justice takes it away from that and says, let's look at what's best for the individual, what's best for the society, and what are the needs? Are they being met by the, by the policies and by the science? And so they want to partner with science. So I see a lot of my, you know, feminist colleagues as wanting to be, sci wanting to use the science. And that's the scientist feminist part. É, a minha pesquisa de doutorado foi a respeito das neurofeministas e da rede Neurogenders, que foi formada em 2010, da qual você faz parte, ao lado de outras pesquisadoras, tanto das neurociências, como do campo das ciências sociais e dos estudos sociais da ciência. A interdisciplinaridade, portanto, é uma das marcas do grupo que procura combater os chamados neurosexismos e o determinismo biológico, construindo conhecimento científico assumidamente feminista. É, ou seja... Ao mesmo tempo que rejeita né, e critica visões reducionistas, como a ideia corrente de que haveria um cérebro feminino, objetivo, localizável, completamente oposto ao cérebro masculino, a rede ressalta também a necessidade de se realizar pesquisas aplicadas em neurociências, informadas pelos estudos feministas e que lide com a materialidade dos corpos e cérebros. Você poderia comentar um pouco sobre a rede Neurogenders para o público brasileiro que não conhece? É, o grupo tem se mantido ativo? Você poderia comentar um pouco sobre as discussões que têm sido feitas atualmente? I would love to do so, but you can, in fact, maybe, Marina, say even more about the Neurogenders Network. I can't tell you how thrilled and honored that, you know, our group was when you decided to study the group and, in fact, you know, work it into your doctoral work. So we are very thankful for that. The Neurogenders group, I will say, has been one of one of the many highlights of my time as this as a feminist neuroscientist. Um, a little history of the group is that we are now um, going on 11 years old, and we uh, it was started by Annalise Kaiser um, and Isabel Dussage back in 2010, and it started as a conference, a small, small mini conference um, for those feminists out there who were also neuroscientists or, you know, um, STS scholars, sociologists of science, anthropologists of science who uh, were interested in the neurosciences, but were squarely located in, in as feminists as well. And you're exactly right. The idea was to how do we um, build uh, that exactly that science that we desire, that we want to know about. Um, And uh, at the same time, counter a lot of those claims that come out that are essentializing, that are deterministic. So the network, and this is the beauty of you know, a feminist network, not everybody has to be on the same page, 
right? We all have very different kind of locations and interests. And that's what I think uh, is the strength of the organization and why we've in fact grown to the size that we are now. Um, uh, 11 years later, we're being contacted by people around the world who have found out about the group's work. Um, and we have divided kind of into different areas. So we have experts, and you mentioned Cordelia Fine's work, for example, or Gina Ripon's work, where they, uh, Rebecca Jordan Young, they have been doing such an incredible job to count, do a, put out those counterclaims. So when big works come out that say, once again, you know, the female brain shows or these studies show that females have such an, they have come up with a, a, a methodology and rubric to analyze those such a, those kinds of scientific findings to see, you know, where were, were there biases embedded within the hypo hypothesis? What kind of language, what kind of paradigms are they using to, to delineate the brain in these kind of this bimodal way, right? Um, we also have a recent, more recent um, member of the group, Daphna Joel, who has joined, who talks, for example, about the mosaic, the, the mosaic brain. And um, uh, here, the, the idea that no one has, no, no male has just a male brain, or no female has just a female brain, that it's always kind of a mixture of male and female, that's one approach, right? So I will say even within this group, though, I, I do think that the our richness is in our diversity of ideas. And so I often push my, my dear colleagues in this group to say, even if we have a mosaic, for example, why is it just simply male or female, right? How do we not know that part of the brain is actually mostly influenced by your diet, uh, by the amount of sunlight that you have, uh, you know, exposed to? by um, memories. And when now we know with epigenetics, for example, right, that how much of our um, histories, and this can be passed down from generation to generation, can be influenced. So once again, this is my idea of feminism to explode the number of differences, right? Not merely keep it to a male and female. Uh, but the, the group is doing great. And um, in fact, we had our last meeting in, um, March of 2020, um, it was in Leiden, and I was invited to give a keynote, as along with um, someone whose work is incredible. Her name is Ashley Backus Clark. Uh, she is a, a black feminist artist, theorist, and neuroscientist. And so the two of us gave keynotes, and the theme of our conference in 2020 was intersectionality and feminist neuroscience. So, you know, so far, a lot of our colleagues have been thinking about the, you know, the male female brain, but exactly that question of intersectionality um, through, for example, Kimberly Crenshaw's work um, here in the States and through a lot of black feminist theory, uh, I think this is gonna be that pivot point for the group to really open up uh, to more discussions that go beyond just sex. Bom, continuando, é, uma atenção que a discussão sobre a interdisciplinaridade pode acabar evidenciando é a hierarquização entre diferentes ciências e diferentes formas de se construir conhecimento científico. Um comentário frequente, por exemplo, feito às correntes de crítica feminista à ciência, é que se estaria apenas criticando, sem de fato fazer uma ciência feminista aplicada. É possível lidar com essas diferentes formas de conhecimento de modo simétrico e não hierarquizado? Afinal, o campo composto dos STS permite a coexistência vívida de muitas entradas empíricas né, e seus estudiosos com formações e orientações teóricas e metodológicas diversas, o que, obviamente, também não se dá sem ruídos e silêncios. Há um trecho divertido, logo na introdução de Molecular Feminism, em que você narra um episódio no qual um conhecido sociólogo da ciência, cujo nome não é mencionado, interessa sem saber como, então, uma recém-doutora em neurociências e biologia molecular acabou parando em um Women's Studies Department. Enquanto você explicava que estava tentando juntar feminismo e ciência para produzir novas conversas, ele acaba concluindo que você seria uma etnógrafa e estaria estudando cientistas no laboratório. Você, então, comenta que se fazer etnografia significa 
observar e interpretar as pessoas e as ações das pessoas e a cultura ao seu redor, sim. Mas que, de fato, não havia essa intenção da sua parte, nem qualquer sistematização das interações e trocas. Ainda assim... Para nós, parece interessante pensar sua abordagem e o fazer etnográfico em regiões de vizinhança transpolinizadora. Alguns talvez diriam que o que você faz não deixa de ser uma espécie de autoetnografia de laboratório. Outros ainda poderiam argumentar que seu trabalho é uma variação de etnografias multiespécies e antropologia da vida. De todo modo, e sem querer aqui domesticar as diferenças, enquadrá-la de imediato em algum rótulo, consideramos extremamente válidas suas reflexões para aqueles que, como eu e várias outras pessoas presentes aqui no evento, realizam pesquisas de campo envolvendo práticas laboratoriais, clínicas e tecnocientíficas de um modo geral. Você se vale da instigante ideia de Ian Hacking, segundo o qual os experimentos possuiriam vida própria. E fala também de uma noção de uma experimental togetherness, em torno de objetos compartilhados de perplexidade. Queria, então, te ouvir um pouco sobre os experimentos enquanto processos de experimentação e sobre a importância do humor nesses amálgamas científicas heterogêneos produzidos por aquilo que Stanger chamou de ecologia das práticas. Enquanto herdeira da famosa guerra das ciências e transgressora de limites acadêmicos, você considera possível produzir zonas de indiscernibilidade entre diferentes práticas fazedoras de conhecimento? não tomando de antemão disciplinas já organizadas e pré-estabelecidas? Thank you so much, Marcos, for this great question. And I, um, I, you know, I just want to say to both of you, I, I'm just so blown away by um, this kind of scholarly generosity that you are extending to me. Your questions show me how deeply you've gone into my work. And obviously with your own expertise, you're, you're making links to other uh, scholarship and bodies of knowledge for me. So I wanna thank you for that. Um, Marco, so your question, as I understand it, uh, there's several layers in here. I'm gonna start with this last part that you just said, you know, as an heir of the famous science war, transgressor of academic boundaries, do you consider it possible to produce zones of indiscernibility? between different knowledge making practices? So, you know, I use this uh, zone of indiscernibility mostly as kind of that, um, I mean, it kind of has an impact in many ways, but uh, in that um, equation between the knower and the known, right? I try to say that, well, how do you create that zone of indiscernibility and at least recognize it that you know you are not separate from, but you're asking me as I understand it is how do we produce though between different knowledge making practices? And for that, it's, it's a great question because I think we have to actually learn what we need to unlearn. And what I mean by that is that I think because I trained as a scientist and then I seriously took on the task of trying to learn, you know, women's gender sexualities, but philosophy of science particularly, and um, learn the language of that, my project has really been, like I can hear the same message in both places or the same question, but how they're posed is very different, right? So you kind of, that zone of indiscernibility is to try to bring these two, what seems to be separate fields, but in fact, it's the same question. It's the same thought. It's just been, it's being said in a different way. And I think that inside outside perspective that, you know, um, uh, Marina was asking me about before, it has given me this like dual um, sense, dual hearing. <laughs> I don't know how, what to call it. So when my scientific colleagues, for example, they are talking about an experiment, they're showing their work, as soon as there's a pause or a hesitation around an ethical query, for example, and in, in a scientific pr presentation, you're supposed to just glide all over that, right? You, you bypass it if you can, but if you need to mention it, it's like one line. But I feel like I hear that more readily than uh, I, I think um, my scientific colleagues hear it because I have been spending time thinking about these questions 
with other, uh, you know, um, knowers. So I think that interdisciplinarity, unfortunately, happens. It can happen. <laughs> Maybe there's multiple ways, but it can happen when you do train in the two areas, and then you can learn how to bring them together and make them indiscernible. All right. So I don't know if I answered that one. That was uh, that was a tough one, but. Uh, I'll go to your uh, your other point. Um, uh, oh, the for instance, a frequent comment made to certain trends of the feminist critique of science is that they tend to mostly criticize and not actually practice applied feminist science. So you know, this is it. I think I had some. I knew those critiques before I entered into the lab, and that is a benefit of the you know feminist scholars before me. And they laid the groundwork down for this, right? So people like Donna Haraway, who I know you all appreciate Donna Haraway's work, and Sandra Harding's work, uh, Helen Longino's work, Londa Scheibinger's work, these were all things that I think made my entrance into the lab possible because it was not a surprise of what kind of um, dilemmas or problems in a way that I was going to face. The, the critiques were already there. And I think um, it was other feminists who were not in the sciences, who were my mentors at the time, who s encouraged me to stay in the sciences and to, you know, try to apply some of this, um, these critiques or the knowledge from these critiques at the level of the lab bench. Um, and that leads to that the last part of your question is I found myself, you know, observing um, those in my lab who didn't identify as being feminist. I think wherever you are, no matter what working space, you know, you are aware of the um, people and machines and technology and software around you. That's part of our lives, right? And it, it's in this kind of exploration of our world making that I think I, I was super vigilant about that because maybe as that outsider, as the imposter, you kind of, you, you get signals of how you're marked as being different. And so, and actually, I don't know if you can see here, one of the things there is, that's my lab coat from years ago, I kept it. I mean, I wore a red lab coat, so I marked myself as being different. And so to observe people's reaction to that lab coat itself was part of the process of like, how do you navigate as a feminist in this scientific space? And so I found that very interesting and engaging and it didn't, it's something you can't let go of even if you try. So I don't know if that, that kind of addressed your question. Thank you so much. Uma das discussões importantes é, é sobre a capacidade da vida no laboratório e de pensarmos com as bactérias, uma das nossas ancestrais mais antigas na Terra, e sua comunicação, escrita e sexo abstrato e informacional. Você conta que trabalha com culturas de células in vitro, derivadas de camundongos transgênicos. Sabemos de sua opção de fazer conexões por parentesco e ilusorismo uma posição segundo a qual toda matéria é viva, por oposição ao ilemorfismo aristotélico, que opõe e hierarquiza forma e matéria. Ou seja, você opta, então, por operar no mesmo plano de univocidade imanente. Todavia, algumas diferenças, às vezes moleculares, às vezes molares, também fazem a diferença. É, se trabalhar com bactérias possibilita algumas relações e perguntas, trabalhar com animais que possuem uma face tem algum efeito relevante. É, em minha pesquisa de doutorado, uma etnografia em um laboratório de engenharia biomédica, parte dos pesquisadores produ produziam inflamação em camundongos e em ratos para estudar tecnologias diagnósticas ultrassônicas. Para eles, essa partilha não mimética do sofrimento era complexa, e trabalhar com o modelo animal era algo que nem todos encampavam e muitos desistiam. É, sendo assim, como pensar nesse co entre cientistas e cobaias, para além da posição de vítimas da ciência. É, talvez, como sugere Harway, pensando nesses seres como trabalhadores da ciência, actantes não humanos com capacidades expressivas e com as quais temos de ter responsibility, ou capacidade de responder. 
como você visualiza os lugares dos animais na ciência? É, e sobre as novas perguntas e modelos que se propõem a ser substitutos para matanças da vivissecção? por meio de simulações, modelagens físicas ou transposições de perguntas para experimentações em vivo, ou através de dispositivos minimizadores de crueldades. A partir e além do trabalho da bióloga McClintock, você desenvolve a ideia de feeling around for the organism. Em termos de biologia sintética, onde genoma mínimo e vida orgânica são combinadas para formar seres com genoma inteiramente produzidos, ou seja, vida sintética, é, e onde, portanto, as fronteiras entre produção técnica e reprodução vital se tornam cada vez mais borradas, portanto, né, você acredita que as noções de organismo e espécie ainda fazem sentido? E se sim, de quais formas? This too, it's such a rich question. I feel like after, you know, your questions, Marcos and uh, Marina, I need to write another book. Uh, to be able to address what you are asking here. It's really quite uh, incredible. So, um, Marcos, I think I hear two main kind of things that I'd like to respond to here. Um, it's really great to hear about your uh, doctoral work uh, and that you're doing an ethnography uh, in a biomedical engineering laboratory. Um, and, you know, hearing about kind of the response or the reaction of the researchers themselves in trying to induce inflammation in the mice and the rats and that for some of them you know uh they give up they don't want to continue it for whatever reason to me that is a really important pause that is an important place where we must stop and think and that i don't know where your you know ethnography is going but exploring what makes uh, a scientist turn away from a certain type of form of experimentation, I think is important. So in my own case, for example, I knew going in um, when I was actually applying for my uh, doctoral program, I told my uh, PI that even though this is a reproductive neuroendocrinology project, and this is in the department of physiology, I'm not going to do animal research. Now, that was my own choice, right? Um, and I decided that I would do in vitro research. Now, I know very well that it's just maybe kind of a, a, a different level, but I still had to kill. At the end of the day, I still had to kill something that was alive in order for me to study. Now, is you know, your, your second question about an organism or a species, like whether it's a single cell or it's an actual, you know, an in vitro single cell or it's an animal, you're still killing. And what we, I think, as scientists have to think about more is what is kind of our understanding and what is the meaning of killability that we've created in our societies and for what means, right? It's always, and so much of this work is, that there's some kind of utility behind it, right? That these workers, as you put it at some point, right? The animals being thought of as science workers. I mean, they didn't get, they didn't sign up for that. We signed them up for that. And now we're calling them the workers. So um, to me, these are, you know, these are questions that we do need to pause on and maybe it will lead to a different type of partnering with you know, uh, science collaborators, whether that means we do things, we move things to, you know, computer modeling, or we do create, in some cases, as we have, and we can maybe talk about this, the synthetic organisms, right? So scientists are exploring these venues, um, whether they're better, whether they think, you know, like, you know, they, they've created these kind of um ontological understanding where now the the metaphor is the model or the the model is no longer our model but and the metaphor is not a metaphor but it is actually what they think of as life so you know in the example that dna is uh you know a, a, a computer language or it's code well we now have dna synthesizers right because we think that's what dna is um and you know we think that all you need for an organism that's important in a minimal genome organism, for example, 
is for its need to reproduce, right? To, if you're using a recombinant DNA technology to integrate that piece of DNA, to multiply that piece of DNA and then reproduce. So we have put our kind of measures of like success through this idea of utility. And that question of what else is happening, what else of life exists beyond that metaphor or the model is something that I think some scientists are exploring. But once again, it becomes the minor literature in science. It becomes the story less told. And so if there is a way to you know, find out if uh, you know, this producing inflammation in mice is maybe producing some other kind of inflammation in that human researcher, that scientist, who's stressed by that act of producing inflammation. There's that hylozoism, there's that connection, there's that like kinship, there's that kind of, that movement of matter and life between uh, all those involved in the experiment. Um, I'm thinking about also, in my own case, I was studying circadian rhythmicity in these neurons, right? But the neurons, they every six hours, they held a pulsatility and they would release the GnRH hormone. Every six hours, I had to measure that. For four years, my circadian rhythms had to match those of this in vitro model. So who was influencing who, whom at that point, you know? So I think that this is, there is a sharing. It might be a sharing of suffering. It might be a sharing of killability. It might be a sharing of all kinds of things, but um, these are just the stories we don't get to explore. And I'd like, that's what I like to spend my time with, so. Bom, em seu livro, você menciona pesquisas com hormônios com finalidade contraceptiva e testes realizados pela indústria farmacêutica em mulheres na Índia. A própria história do desenvolvimento da pílula hormonal anticoncepcional, que é bastante conhecida, envolveu testes com mulheres latinas em Porto Rico, o que expõe diversas questões éticas da ciência ligadas à raça, classe e gênero. É, além disso, como denunciado por muitas pesquisadoras feministas, o Brasil tem um largo histórico de violação de direitos nesse campo. Um dos casos mais conhecidos é o do Norplan. É um implante hormonal contraceptivo testado em mulheres brasileiras, em sua maioria pobres. E os testes do Norplan eles foram interrompidos depois de denúncias de feministas na década de 80 e 90, de que, entre outras coisas, informações sobre possíveis efeitos colaterais estariam sendo obtidos às, às participantes e que haveria intimidação daquelas que solicitassem a retirada do implante antes do prazo máximo de sua duração, que era de cinco anos. O caso do Norplan ele não é único e está ligado a um quadro mais amplo de desigualdades raciais, econômicas, políticas e sociais. Isso não acontece apenas no, no campo dos testes de hormônios com finalidade contraceptiva. Como nos mostra a nossa colega pesquisadora da antropologia da ciência, Rosana Castro, em seus trabalhos recentes, as pesquisas clínicas para o desenvolvimento da vacina para a Covid-19 evidenciam e reatualizam muitas dessas desigualdades. Justamente por conta da disseminação descontrolada do vírus e alta mortalidade, o Brasil foi considerado um dos locais privilegiados para a realização de testes com as vacinas. Ou seja, o caos e o descontrole da epidemia de Covid-19 no Brasil seria justamente um dos atrativos para que os testes com vacinas fossem realizados por aqui. É, ao mesmo tempo, a participação do país em tais testes não implicou necessariamente em transferência de tecnologia para o Brasil ou em um maior acesso da população brasileira a essas vacinas. A população continua morrendo a larga escala, sobretudo pessoas negras e pobres, enquanto a vacinação vem acontecendo muito lentamente. É claro que esse cenário caótico e triste em que a gente vive, ele é agravado pelo desmonte da saúde, negacionismo e inação do governo, mas não é possível ignorar as desigualdades entre países do norte e do sul e a própria dinâmica dos mercados e experimentos farmacêuticos, como bem nos mostra Rosana Castro. Assim, eu gostaria de pedir, se possível, que você comentasse a respeito dessas desigualdades e da relação com a ciência e a indústria farmacêutica. Além disso, em que sentido uma ciência feminista produzida no norte global poderia contribuir para repensar e questionar essas dinâmicas? Marina, thanks for this question. I just first want to say, um, you know, the effect of this pandemic has hit us all in, you know, at home, in our 
communities, in our neighborhoods, and in our countries. And what's happening in Brazil right now, and particularly there's been a uptick of um, uh, infection rate. So, you know, I, I just want to say, I want to express uh, the concern and sending a hope message to you all there. Um, interestingly, you, you, you started off your question by mentioning the part about my book where I talk about um, the, you know, the work, the contraception uh, testing in India. Uh, my, in, the, in that story, I, was, I, I talk about how I was visiting a, 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 a doctor and her daughter in Jaipur and um, my aunt, who actually uh, introduced me to that doctor, who my aunt herself was a doctor, just passed away a week ago in India from COVID. So it has really hit us all, you know, in, in these ways. Um, I have relatives in India who are, who are, have been vaccinated. India was one of those places where they had the pharmaceutical capacity. People have been vaccinated and now another strain is infecting everyone. So your question, I, you know, it's, it, I, I hear the importance and the richness of the feminist analysis, but if I'm being honest, it's touched our, all of our lives in this way that sometimes it's hard to keep that kind of the, the, the scholarship and the theory and apply it to this moment, for me at least, when it's encapsulated by like death also right now. So I, I apologize if I'm not able to make a very eloquent answer for you here. But I will say that in following the kind of molecular stories, right? If that becomes a way to practice our feminism, and it's not just here in the global north, I think this is everywhere feminists survive and live. It's because they're able to bring some kind of, um, you know, audience to listen to that molecular story, to that minor story, the story that's not being heard, right? That political skill set exists all around the world. As soon as you have two feminists come together, they will start organizing that way. And so I think the if there is to be a solution it has to start locally it has to be uh aware of the knowledge systems and the institutional structures and the um of of its place it'll be very hard to transplant i think one something that works in one place to another but having said that 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 skill set of taking not just gender, not just sex, but one's race, one's class, one's you know socioeconomic formations, one's family structures, that practice of that kind of multiplication of difference or what some people would call intersectional approach to, right? That is what's gonna make, I think, uh, if, if, if any kind of feminist science is to influence what a pharmaceutical is doing and to be held accountable, I think that's gonna be through those practices which don't belong to either the North or the South. Um, so, you know, it's funny. I, I have been vaccinated. I've received both of my doses. I live in the state of Georgia here in the US. And in the beginning, uh, within the rollout of the U.S., Georgia was the second to last. Like no infrastructure, no health, you know, because that's not how people operate here. But the reason I've been vaccinated is because when the vaccines were made available, so many people do not want to be vaccinated. They don't believe in the vaccine, right? That there's an abundance of a vaccine now so that I could make it available and I could take it. But my own parents who are up in Canada because of socialized medicine, they, first of all, did not have access to so many vaccinations, but whatever they do have, they have decided to make sure that everybody gets at least one dose first before the everybody gets a second dose. 
even if that means that the time between the doses is going to be longer. So I see here, like just within our, you know, these three spaces, like how different um, the relationship between the pharmaceutical side and the, you know, the patient side is. I think if, our, you know, our, in a way, I see what's happening up in Canada. Maybe many feminists would also be in line with that. Like everybody should have access. Everybody should have this first, right? And uh, to me, it is maybe a like kind of a feminist model, even though it's being highly criticized by Canadians and definitely within the States, because the States is always comparing itself to, oh, we don't want socialized medicine. And this is a perfect example of like how it could go wrong because now they don't even have vaccinations. So um, I also had a, a colleague reach out to me um, saying, you know, what about the health effects of the AstraZeneca um, vaccination? And that, you know, it's having a differential impact on, on women versus men, right? So this is one of those times where maybe you do, and this is the difference, you know, like what I talk about, multiplying that difference, but that molecular approach is not in opposition to the molar approach. Sometimes you need to start with the N of two and then keep going. And so in this case, if it's been found that certain women are having a reaction to AstraZeneca, yeah, you need to pause. And which, which is what has happened, you know? So I'm, I'm, you know, your, your question is absolutely crucial and rich Marina, but I feel I am lacking kind of my own um, grounding at this moment to be able to give a proper answer. So I'll, I'll end there. Uh, thank you so much, Tebolina. É, infelizmente, nossa conversa está chegando no fim. Gostaria de agradecer imensamente o Debolina Roy pela, por aceitar o convite. Espero que todos tenham é, se inspirado nessa, nesse diálogo. Até mais.